Good afternoon. I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, and I welcome all of you here. I'm really delighted to introduce to you Dr. Megan Lane Fall, who is a physician with very deep commitments to patient safety as well as effective patient care. She is one of our visiting scholars from the University of Pennsylvania, which is one of our initial exchanges that we're doing both with Pennsylvania and with Michigan, and we're really, really happy to have you here. You will find, uh, Megan, that you're in uh, kindred spirits here in this room because all of us really care deeply about high quality care and communication within the healthcare system and healthcare team, and a number of people sitting in the audience who I'm sure will be asking you questions. Um, care deeply about some of the issues that you've been thinking about and doing research, which really has to do with how do we assure that the experience of patients in hospitals, especially as people leave the hospitals, exchange, go to different settings, whether they go home or whether they don't go to home or perhaps back to a nursing home, how do we assure that those levels of communication are as positive and as comprehensive as possible? So uh, Dr. Lane Fall is uh, not only an assistant professor of anesthesiology and critical care at the University of Pennsylvania, but she has been a leader, a co-director of the Center for Perioperative Outcomes Research and Transformation, which I think are really important aspects of all of, for all of us because we are struggling with how do we assure that we're using evidence most effectively, and how do we assure that something that has been found to be effective in one area can then be replicated and implemented and translated so that others pick up on these important lessons. Um, she is also very interested in the use of qualitative measures to incorporate patient voices. So I think you'll find the fact that she's very facile in a variety of different methodologies will be of interest as well. And she has uh, also been very effective as a mentor to a number of young people at the University of Pennsylvania. I'll say younger people <laughs> uh, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in terms of assuring a health services, a robust health services research environment. We want to welcome you back home to the Bay Area where she spent her undergraduate uh, degree at the University of, of uh, California at Berkeley and then went on to Yale for her MD degree where she graduated with great honors and then went to Pennsylvania for her training in anesthesia critical care fellowships and research fellowships so she also has a master's degree in science and health policy and among one of her, um, I would say, honors is that um, she's the mother of two daughters and is also a science fiction fanatic. Absolutely. So, welcome. Thank you, Claire, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to share my science with you. I'm happy to take questions at any point, so if there are things that come up that you want to discuss, please feel free to, to say something. Um, I'm going to talk to you about where my happy space is, which is the intersection of quality and safety and implementation science. So let's get started. The work that I'm going to talk about was funded primarily by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, but I have some other funding from the groups on the screen. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Um, I do declare, as Claire mentioned, that I went to college at Berkeley, and so I do feel like I'm home. I did research at San Francisco General when it there was a green space and there wasn't a hospital on it, um, but it's still nice to be home. Go Bears. Go Bears. So my objectives for this time is to talk a little bit about challenges to evidence translation, specifically in perioperative care, which is where I spend my time thinking because I'm an anesthesiologist, and then also talk about hybrid effectiveness implementation trials as a mechanism to study both effectiveness and implementation together when we have evidence that we think is good, but maybe doesn't meet that bar of multiple randomized controlled trials. I want to tell you a little bit first about my lab, talk about implementation science and how its reliance on evidence-based practice can be problematic depending on where your area of focus is as, um, as a scholar. I'll take you through a case study of OR to ICU handoffs to walk you through how I think about applying implementation science principles to perioperative care, and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. First, my lab. So the goal of my lab, which is a group of very intrepid undergrads and postbacs and some medical students, is to advance patient-centered, high-quality acute care. 
So um, I take uh, inspiration from the Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Academy of Medicine, their domains of quality care, and my lab really focuses on safety and patient-centeredness. We also, I have been really touched by the idea that people come to us to get better and we can make them worse. We can actually subject people to harm as they present for care. And so if you look at the leading causes of death in the US, you will not see healthcare on that list. Um, but if you put it there, it would be number three. And we can, as researchers, quibble with the methodology and quibble with the numbers, but it's somewhere in the order of 100,000 to 500,000 deaths that are associated with healthcare, which are deaths that shouldn't be happening. And so this is my North Star as I think about doing my work. Implementation science, as you all know, bridges the evidence to practice gap, and so that's one area where I like to focus and think about how can I improve patient care and the quality of care. There are a lot of interventions that we know work, and so let's take what works and try to actually get it into effective practice. But one of the challenges I've had as an anesthesiologist is that the evidence-based practice is the price of entry. You don't get to play in the implementation science sandbox unless you have an evidence-based practice. And it's built into the definition of implementation science. If you go back to the very first edition of the flagship journal, 2006, they said the goal of implementation science is to promote the systematic uptake of research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. So again, this is your ticket of entry. If you don't have an evidence-based practice, you don't get to come in the door. When we think about what evidence-based means, oftentimes we're talking about randomized controlled trials, Sometimes we're talking about systematic reviews and meta-analyses and potentially per, uh, professional society guidelines. So the AHA says this, or the American Cancer Society says that. In perioperative care, we have some issues with that. The first is um, we don't have a very robust research workforce. So if you think about as someone's deciding what to do with their career, money is certainly an issue. Is it more lucrative? Is it more straightforward to go into clinical practice versus research? We, we deal with this a lot in anesthesia and in surgery it's hard to actually get people into the research workforce. And then when they get into the research workforce, you think about the translational research spectrum, we have a lot of folks on the early side of the translational research spectrum. We have a lot of people doing T0, T1 work, which is really important basic science mechanistic work or bench to bedside. We have, very, we have fewer people doing T3, T4 work. So when you think about the type of work that I'm interested in, which relates to quality and safety, <coughs> We don't have a lot of randomized control trials. We have a lot of quasi-experimental studies. We have a lot of pre-post studies, underpowered studies, and that is our evidence base. Uh, another issue that we have is that we have evidence-based concepts more than evidence-based practices that are very precise. And so I'll give you three examples here. I teach implementation science at Penn, and we have students routinely who come through and say, I'm interested in palliative care. Palliative care is evidence-based. But what is palliative care? What does it look like? Who, who delivers it? What exactly does that intervention look like? It can play out in lots of different ways. And so the concept of palliative care is evidence-based, but the actual execution of it can take different forms. Similarly, in anesthesia, we talk about goal-directed fluid therapy. So if you come into the operating room, we shouldn't just be flooding you with IV fluids. We should be titrating to some particular goal, whether it's a blood pressure, whether it's a central venous pressure, whether it's um, some other sort of pulse pressure variability, some indicator that you actually need volume. But what does that look like in practice? It can take lots of different forms. And then what I'll talk to you about, um, structured handoffs. So we know when we look at shift to shift handoffs, whether it's with residents, whether it's with staff, whether it's with nurses, or transitions in care across sites of care, that when you infuse structure into these interactions, that that improves information transmission and improves patient outcomes, but exactly how you do that is a question. So as a budding scientist, and I think there are some budding scientists in the crowd and also some very well-established scientists, I know that, um, I was faced with this question of do I build evidence because our evidence base isn't great, or do I study implementation of something that already has an evidence base? And so, um, for those of you who know Yogi Berra, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So, it's both is where, where I ended up. <clears throat> so with some collaborators at Penn, um, actually, Renad Betis, who's um, my partner in crime at Penn, and Jeff Curran, who is at the University of Arkansas, uh, he came up with the idea of hybrid effectiveness implementation trials, which I'll talk about. But one of the things that all three of us have faced as we talk to people about implementation science and whether whatever thing they're interested in is actually implementation science, is we kind of, we, we conceptualize this subway, this um, implementation science subway. And so when people come to us and they say, I have a question, I have an idea, but I don't know if it's actually implementation science. We said, okay, well, let's put you on the subway. And so we talk, we ask them to identify whatever their thing is. And we use this language because of 
that imprecision with evidence base. So if it's palliative care, if it's structured handoffs, maybe it's aspirin after an MI, maybe it's super specific, but there is a thing that you're interested in, an evidence-based thing. So we say, identify whatever your thing is. That's actually really hard. Sometimes people have an idea that they want to improve care, but they don't have an idea of what that evidence-based practice is. So that's, that's a little bit of work, is to identify your thing. And then we ask them, is the thing shown efficacy? Is there a randomized controlled trial? Are there, are there ideally conducted studies that show you that the thing works? If there aren't, then you need to do it because you don't know if that thing actually works. And so you do efficacy research. You can design for implementation. So as you're designing your palliative care intervention, as you're designing your care coordination intervention, you can keep implementation science principles in mind. You can design something that is implementable, but you still need to do this work to figure out whether it could work in an ideal circumstance. But if it has shown efficacy, then we move on to effectiveness. So then we ask, has it shown effectiveness? And the difference here is, I'm sure you all know, effectiveness is real world, right? So does this thing work in the real world? If it does, great, do implementation studies. Let's figure out how to get it into practice. If it hasn't, you need to do that work, but you can do that work along with looking at implementation. And that's where the hybrid effectiveness implementation trials come in. And so they give you that option to actually study both at the same time. So you might ask, if you're on that subway somewhere, why, why are you barreling ahead? Why are you hell-bent on doing the implementation research when you don't know if it's effective or not? Um, one of the really important reasons that, that we've identified at Penn is that there is a tension for change. And um, you know, and I had a nice conversation today with, with Catherine Chen about sometimes payers want to move, patients want to move, hospitals want to move, and whether you study it or not, they're doing the thing. Right? So there, there isn't this sort of suspended animation, I'm going to take time to figure out whether it works. You know that um, the field is moving that way. And so that tension for change means that you can't really stand still. And that's one important reason that I have thought about needing to do these, these studies together. That tension can come from clinicians, it can come from administrators and patients, um, but also the public. If they decide that there's something that should be happening, let's, let's go ahead and move forward. So, um, as I started to study implementation science, and I took my first implementation science class in 2012, and one of my professors was John Kimberly, who's at Wharton, very distinguished um, organizational researcher, and as part of the class he said, we'll pick an evidence-based practice that's relevant to your work, because they were going to walk us through doing an implementation science study, and I said, we, we don't have a lot of those in anesthesia, um, and he goes, we'll think of something, and I said, okay, handoffs. This is the closest thing I can come to an evidence-based practice in anesthesia, is just <coughs> handoffs. So just to orient you, um, basically this, this exchange that I'm interested in happens when a patient goes from the operating room to the intensive care unit directly. So if you imagine that a patient has gotten in a car accident, for instance, and you had a devastating abdominal injury, maybe you had a splenic rupture, you need an exploratory laparotomy, you're still very sick. When you come out of the operating room, you don't go to the recovery room. You're too sick for that. You need to go directly to an intensive care unit. And what happens is that you, and largely you're incapacitated, so you have no idea what's going on, your surgery team needs to take you to the intensive care unit and they need to communicate to the intensive care unit team who you are, what you had done, what's going to happen, and how to help move you through this period of time. What you're relying on is that that team can come together and have an effective conversation and continue the care that you've been through. So basically what you should see in, a, in an ideal world is that you have a team here together. So you've got an anesthetist, that's me with the spiky hair. Um, you've got a surgeon, you've got an ICU provider who's a physician or an advanced practice provider who um, is admitting you to the ICU, and you've got a nurse, and you're talking together, one at a time, about what's going on with this patient and what will happen in the perioperative course. And you've got other staff that are in the room that are helping keep the patient stable, help keeping them settled, but really you have a team conversation that's happening. When my team and I did a synthesis of the literature, we found that Although there were many different ways that this manifested in the literature, and there were, when we started our work, about 14 different studies, and now there are more than 60, uh, they all had the same sort of themes in mind. And so there was a choreography of the handoff, basically, that, that all of these investigators settled on. So this gray box, which um, is a handoff process, I think of it as a handoff dance. Essentially what you have is before a patient ever arrives into the intensive care unit, you've got some sort of pre-handoff preparation which can be a phone call, it can be an actual physical visit, but there's some notification from the operating room to the intensive care unit that you've got a sick patient on the way. The patient then comes into the ICU, they're stabilized, they're hooked back up to a mechanical ventilator if that's relevant, all of their spaghetti is transferred over, so if those of you who've been in an OR or an ICU, you know there's lots of lines and tubes and wires and things that come with people and all that's gotta be transferred over. And only at that point do people talk. So you get 
the patient settles, and only at that point do you talk. And you're talking, your conversation is guided by a tool or a template that has lots of different elements in it. After you've exchanged that information, you then have a discussion and specification of a plan, and then the handoff is over. So the questions that I had relating to this, um, I really had some effectiveness questions. So going back to that question of the strength of the evidence base, we had a, a good number of studies, these 14 <coughs> studies, that showed us that handoff standardization improved information exchange, potentially patient outcomes. But the backstory is that all of those studies were done in cardiac surgery. It's a very specific, very homogenous patient population. I work in a trauma ICU and a mixed surgical ICU, and I said, well, does that apply uh, when you have patients who are their ear, nose, and throat, their trauma, their OBGYN, it's every surgery under the sun except for the heart uh, and the aorta. Can you standardize and does it work the same way? But at the same time, we wanted to know how do you implement something like that. So, I take, again, I take inspiration from lots of people. George Box is another one who's a statistician who said all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> and um, as you know, in implementation science, we use a lot of theories, models, and frameworks. And this, um, for those of you who are new to the field, this is one of my epiphany papers. Uh, when I first started studying implementation science, this, page, this paper had not come out, and there were just, here's a bunch of frameworks. So use one. What does that mean? Which one do you use? How do you use it? How do you use frameworks and models to structure your thinking? But this really helps. And um, what Nielsen conceptualized was uh, frameworks that are descriptive, but that have arrows in them, essentially. They're process models. They're causal models. There are models that are um, sort of buckets, just lists of factors that you should consider, and then models that you can use for evaluation. So in thinking about our work in OR to ICU handoffs, we actually used three frameworks. Um, the first two identified a priori, and then the third one came later. Um, sometimes it's useful to have models that you use to explain your work, even if they didn't inform the creation of the work. And so the three frameworks that we used were CIFR, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, which is a determinant model. Proctor model, which is a process model, and the EPIS model, which is a process model. And I'll walk you through how that uh, played out in our research. <clears throat> so CIFR, as some of you may know, is a, is a, it's a consolidated framework. It takes lots of other frameworks and puts it together in a list of factors that influence implementation. CIFR is broken up into five different large domains, and each of those domains has constructs. There are upwards of 30 CIFR constructs at this point, but uh, the ones that were most relevant to our work are here. So as we're thinking about how do we create and implement a structured OR to ICU handoff process? How do we change the behavior of these anesthesiologists, surgeons, nurses, ICU providers? We thought about, well, what is it about the intervention that we need to consider? What about the outer setting, everything else that's happening in the world? What is it about the inner setting or the ICU environment that we need to consider? What about the individual? So how do I need to talk to a surgeon versus an anesthesiologist? And then what should the process of implementation look like? And those constructs related to the domains led us into uh, which outcomes we chose to study from an implementation standpoint. From a process perspective, uh, we looked at Enola Proctor's process model, which relates intervention strategies up here to implementation strategies to outcomes. And we translated Proctor's model into one that looked a little bit more like what we were doing. And basically the idea was that we, we thought that if we came up with a structured handoff process that was both acceptable and feasible, that people would adhere to it, which is what we call fidelity. If they exhibited fidelity, we'd see improvements in teamwork and communication. If we saw those, we would see improvements in the appropriateness of care and provider outcomes like satisfaction and burnout and ultimately improvement in patient outcomes. And when you flesh that out a little bit more, each of these constructs has different measures that are associated with it. And so you can see how it becomes very clear how we can sort of step through what the potential causal pathways are so that we can figure out whether these relationships are in fact true. Uh, the EPIS framework is also really useful thinking about how an implementation study might unfold. Um, and we, perhaps serendipitously, sort of came up with the structure without knowing about the model. But the idea here is that you explore what's happening first, you do contextual inquiry, you prepare to implement, you implement, and then you work on sustainment. So that led us to our study, which is HATRIC. So Handoffs and Transitions in Critical Care is the acronym for the study. This is a screen grab from our website, and these are two nurses that were in our ICU. Uh, it was a prospective mixed methods quasi-experimental type 2 hybrid effectiveness implementation trial, which is a little bit of a mouthful, um, but I'll walk you through what, uh, how, we, how we put it together. So um, there's familiarity in the audience with implementation signs. You've probably heard of hybrid trials. There are three types with varying emphases on implementation and effectiveness. Our study was a type 2 hybrid trial, and so we were testing both a clinical intervention, but we were also looking at, at implementation outcomes.
the setting of the study is the Penn Medicine Health System, which is an urban academic health system. Two different hospitals, two different mixed surgical ICUs, one of them newer than the other. So this is the Pavilion for Advanced Care and our Trauma Surgery ICU. This is a patient room, and then our Rhodes Five Surgical Intensive Care Unit, which has been around um, much longer, probably about 30 or 40 years. Our participants were both patients and clinicians. So as an implementation science-focused study, really the clinicians were the target, but we were also observing patient care. And so the IRB was interesting. I'm happy to answer questions about that if you guys have questions about that. But we were interested in surgeons, anesthesia staff, ICU nurses, and ICU ordering providers, and then also the clinical leadership, because their buy-in and engagement was really important to executing any type of change. Our timeline unfolded um, starting in 2014 to now. So contextual inquiry took us um, a little bit of time, a lot of time actually, and that should be October 2014 or 2015 there on the bottom. So it was four or five months of contextual inquiry, designing an intervention, going live, and then looking at what happened after. We considered having a control group, um, but there weren't any other comparable ICUs within their health system, so that's the quasi-experimental piece. It's essentially pre-post. The way that we deal with threats to inference is looking at a lot of different outcomes over time. Our measures relate to the mixed methods, hybrid effectiveness implementation nature of the study, and so our primary outcome was information emissions, which is an indicator of information transmission. The reason we chose that was we wanted our work to be in conversation with all the other studies that had been published, and all of those studies had looked at some measure of information exchange, specifically information emissions. But you can see that there were many other outcomes that we were interested in. In terms of data collection strategies, we uh, observation was the bulk of what we did. So we parked people in the ICU in different rooms watching these interactions between clinicians. We actually did some video observations as well to look for the Hawthorne effect. Uh, there wasn't any discernible Hawthorne effect, which was great. Um, but our observations consisted of research assistants using structured data forms, answering open-ended questions about interaction, engagement between the participants, taking field notes, and then doing audio recording to um, check what they had heard interviews, focus groups, lots of chart reviews and surveys. In terms of sample size calculation, so we powered our study to, to detect a 33% change in information emissions, but we, because it's mixed methods, we wanted to reach thematic saturation at the same time. So it was sort of picking the sample size that would get us both. So um, it turned out that reaching thematic saturation from a qualitative perspective actually overpowered us for the quantitative outcome, so that was good. So basically what we did was look at two study units um, across daytime and nighttime because we knew that the previous literature just across handoffs showed that there were differences in daytime and nighttime handoffs. And then we were also interested in elective versus emergent surgery. So what happens when we know coming into the hospital that you're going into the ICU versus someone who had a mishap in the OR and ends up in the ICU or they were a trauma that then they weren't expecting to come in. In terms of study flow, um, again, the EPIS framework is not how we started, but it actually tracks really well with what we did. So from an exploration perspective, the questions that we asked were, how are we doing this now? So we're looking at what people are doing, we're talking to them and doing surveys to figure out how they approach the process now. From a preparation standpoint, we were asking, well, what does a structured handoff process look like in this crazy heterogeneous mixed surgical ICU? So it was taking the literature synthesis, developing prototypes, and then doing insight to simulation to work with clinicians to develop a process that worked for them. Then from an implementation standpoint, the question is how do you get people to actually do it? There are lots of training and evaluation. And then we're now in the sustainment phase where the question is do clinicians exhibit fidelity over time with us without us actually doing anything? So I'll walk you through what our results look like. Um, from the pre-intervention state, we started off with surveys. Um, response rate was really challenging, which is a, something we, we probably would have done differently. What we found was our response rate was lowest with nurses because they have too much email. So um, in our sustainment phase, we're actually doing surveys in person and taking them to people, which is better. But one of the questions we wanted to ask was, really, what would make you change what you do now? So which of these types of pieces of evidence would actually change your behavior? If we showed you that a different process improved communication or patient outcomes, would that actually sway your behavior? And it, it gave us a little bit of insight. People are really interested in evidence. Um, so the one that got the highest response was, if we could show them that a different handoff process actually improved patient outcomes, they'd be really engaged. Interestingly, almost no one said that they were satisfied with what was happening now. So that sort of gave us the burning platform. Like, we can disagree about what the structured handoff process looks now, but just about everybody is saying that something needs to change. So that was useful. We also did free listing in our surveys, and we asked people to describe, just describe a handoff. 
Just give us three words or phrases and describe what a handoff in ORAD ICU handoff looks like right now. And we got some, some good answers, like clear and concise and efficient, but many, many more awkward, choppy, chaotic, people don't know what they're doing, um, this is wasteful. And so again, this gave us the sense that there is some tension for change with our stakeholders. When we did interviews and focus groups, we asked about barriers to potentially standardizing the OR to ICU handoff process. What people told us was that the handoff was just low priority, that there were many other things that they had to do, and that they had time constraints. So the operating room team had to get back to the operating room. The intensive care unit team had a unit full of people they had to take care of. And so while everybody could agree in theory that handoffs were important, it was very hard to prioritize in the moment because of all the other things that they had to do. People told us that the actual quality of the handoff was affected by professionalism and teamwork and whether people were really engaged in being part of that team, whether they took it seriously or whether they didn't. And we found that people were frustrated by the fact that sometimes providers were there, sometimes they weren't, and sometimes our residents had insufficient knowledge of what happened, especially in the operating room. So we would see anesthesia residents or surgery residents who assumed care of the patient near the very end of the operating room case, and they were essentially glorified transporters. So when they got to the ICU, they knew essentially nothing about the patient, and the nurses and the ICU staff were understandably very frustrated by that. When we did observations, um, our, our RAs were really funny because they, they said, I don't know if a handoff happened. The patient went into the room, but no one talked to each other. Um, so was that a handoff or not? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, so the mode, the modal um, observation was that we had some type of conversation in the hallway between the ICU provider and the surgeon. So they're there physically in the unit, they're talking to each other. There's an anesthetist in the room who may be talking to the room, that actually happened quite a bit, um, or to someone's back. Um, and then a nurse who's completely overwhelmed trying to figure out how to deal with the lines and the tubes and the spaghetti, but is not engaging in the conversation. Um, and then at some point the IC nurse looks up and goes, wait, what happened? So we worked with our clinicians to develop a new handoff process, and uh, we started off with this idea of the clock and then came up with this, with, with kind of call the Candyland poster, but basically did um, in situ simulation with our clinicians and worked through what a structured process might look like. And what we settled on was this. So the steps are really the same, it's just laid out a little bit differently. What we had people do was some communication, so telephone call from the operating room to the intensive care unit to make sure that the ICU knew what was happening. And it's not a handoff, so it's just a heads up. It's Mrs. Smith is really sick, she's vented, you need um, a level one transfuser in the room and make sure you have a bunch of infusion pumps and we'll be up in five minutes. The patient then comes into the room and the providers introduce each other if they don't already know each other. The patient's stabilized. The monitors are transferred over by what we call secondary nursing staff who are any nurses that aren't receiving that patient. And so what happens when the patient rolls in the ICU is that there is an overhead call. In one of the units it's 5014 has arrived and so what that means to any nurse that's on the unit is that you need to go in there if you're not actively doing something right now, go in there and help. Um, in the other ICU, it's swarmed to bed 14. And I don't know why they're different, but that's they're different, but there's an overhead call. So the secondary nurses are settling the patient, and then there's a huddle of providers. And this we called, um, we didn't call a timeout. It is a timeout, but we were told not to use that phrase. And so we listened to the people that we talked to, and so we called it a huddle. The nurse is the trigger for this, so it doesn't start unless the nurse is ready. Uh, when the nurse is ready, the surgeon will then talk about who the patient is, why they're in the ICU, and what surgery they had. The anesthetist will talk about airway issues, hemodynamic issues. The ICU provider then sort of sums everything up, and then everyone looks at the patient together, exchanges contact information, and there's an opportunity for questions. So that was the process that we came up with, and then we had to implement it. So um, my favorite implementation science cartoon, which is I've never actually stormed a castle, but I've taken a bunch of siege management courses, um, which is the idea that implementation is great in theory, but then you actually have to get it done. So we took a cue from Powell, uh, who published a list of implementation, sort of categories of implementation strategies, and this is an oldie buddy goodie too. Um, uh, Byron Powell has since put out another paper with more implementation strategies, but this is what we had to go with at the time. And so of the six categories he put out, we chose the first four to focus on, planning, education, restructuring of work, and then quality management. So our implementation, uh, planning and education pieces in particular, we did iterative design, which I talked about the insight to simulation. We went to every, everybody's conference, any meeting of any resident, faculty, we went and talked to them about what we were doing and why we were doing it. Lots of emails, of course, and you know there's sort of a, sometimes people read them, sometimes they don't, but we're trying to get them as, as many ways as we can. We created a website, I showed you the screen grab from that, but the website also had an educational component, 
and then a check on knowledge at the end. And so we would say, um, we'll give you a $5 coffee card if you click on the survey, and then they'd have to answer questions about the handoff process to demonstrate that they understood it. We posted flyers, especially in the bathroom. We had an implementation support team that wore these giant buttons, these obnoxious four-inch wide buttons, and they carried granola because the surgeons were hungry. So um, especially the residents, they don't eat. So they bring a patient up to the ICU, and that's their five minutes to go to the bathroom and eat and do whatever. And so we would give them food and then talk to them. And then we designed a mandatory web training that I was trying not to be in, but there was no one else. Mm -hmm. Ralph. Thanks for sharing. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you decided on those things, those elements? Yeah, so I want to say that this was uh, intervention mapping. It was not intervention mapping. It was talking with stakeholders, clinical leaders especially. So in, our, in all of our units, um, in our ICUs in particular, we have unit-based clinical leadership teams. So it's the physician medical director, it's the ICU nurse manager, a quality manager, and then a clinical nurse specialist. And everything we did was in conversation with them. And so it was meeting with them saying, how about this, how about that, how about this? and sort of way finding our way to this list of things. If I had it to do all over again, and, and as I, I'll get to later, we're pursuing multi-center work now, I would use intervention mapping. And so I would specifically say, you know, these are the barriers and facilitators, and these are the particular interventions I want to use. The behavior change wheel, which I know you all know very well, is very useful for that, especially for, for individual level barriers and facilitators. So I would do it differently if I had it to do over again. But um, again, serendipity helped us because it seemed to be a good implementation strategy for this setting. So we did um, mandatory web training now, which all the anesthesia residents have to do, and the ICU nurses were still working on the surgeons. But basically, they go through an interactive thing, um, learning how to do the OR to ICU handoff. So, with respect to implementation measures, as you may know, a lot of our implementation outcomes don't have validated measures, which was one of the reasons that we used a mixed methods approach. So for acceptability, appropriateness, uh, we did qualitative and quantitative measures. Feasibility was entirely qualitative, and then fidelity um, was qualitative, and then quantitative in that we counted the number of steps that people followed. But I'll be the first to admit that there are lots of ways to measure fidelity, and that was probably just the simplest. Uh, when it comes to how we assess all these things, lots of different ways, so uh, it's a really complex study, but interviews and focus groups were really important with respect to the implementation outcomes, but the, the observations helped us as well. I've highlighted acceptability and, fi and fidelity because I'm going to walk you through what our results look like there. So uh, across assessment modalities, acceptability of this intervention was strong. We asked people whether they thought the new process was acceptable, which is a very simple question, and they said yes. Did they use it? Um, we also asked them if they thought that it made patient care better or much better. And although fewer people endorsed this, no one said that it made patient care worse. There were some people who were ambivalent, they just weren't sure. From a qualitative perspective, uh, we heard in people's own voices why they thought this was useful. And so this nurse practitioner said, I think there's been a little bit more cohesion now, too, with the teams because you actually get to know each other because we introduce ourselves. Because of Hattrick, I've actually gotten to know a few of the surgeons and some of the anesthesiologists whose names I otherwise would never have known. So then once you have that, that kind of personal relationship, it just gets it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. When we looked at our event reporting system, our voluntary event reporting system, we also saw Hattrick come up here. Um, what's interesting is it became a part of speech, and I don't know why this is, but it became a noun, it became a verb. People talked about hat-tricking. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's wild. They don't, they don't say handoff. Um, this actually has nothing to do with a nowhere to ICU handoff. This is a PACU to ICU handoff, and they talk about hat-trick. So it's sort of it's infiltrating its way through the organization, which is interesting. When we looked at fidelity, we saw pretty good fidelity to the process. So um, on a zero to 10 list of steps, people were doing more than fewer, but not complete fidelity. But when we look at um, some qualitative information, it gives us a little bit more insight. So on the positive end, we've got this ICU nurse manager who said, all disciplines equate that term with handoff. It's a great catchword that stuck. It's the norm to say in the patient's room, okay, let's hat trick, or is everyone ready for hat trick? It's very interesting because you never hear the phrase, okay, are we ready for handoff? Mm -hmm. On the other side, from an anesthesia resident, uh, this person said, I think ultimately we have to be clinicians and do what we think is best for the patient and not follow a checklist just because that's present. So it's the idea that, yes, it's great that you have this process, but if I think something else is better for patient care, I'm gonna do that other thing. When we looked at our effectiveness outcomes, we found that information omissions decreased, which is what we wanted to see. We saw that teamwork and professionalism improved, and I can describe how we characterize all of these things. The providers were more consistently at bedside. We did not see changes in unit level patient outcomes, and um, powering studies to detect changes in patient outcomes is really tricky. Uh, perhaps we can have discussion about that too. 
Um, but we also saw that the handoff duration increased, which was problematic, at least we thought. Um, we started off at handoffs of about 3.5 minutes, and then we ended up at eight, which was where our pre-specified uh, end of data collection stopped, but then we see that it's sort of attenuated in the sustainability phase. Uh, none of our clinicians have complained about the time. And what the surgeons are telling us, what the ICU team is telling us is that they spend less time outside of the handoff, fielding phone calls, finding people. And so that extra bit of time that they spend in the room, they think is time well spent. When we look at information, teamwork, and professionalism, we thought that they would all track together, going back to that causal model, but we didn't find that that was true. So what you're looking at here is a heat map where each row is an observation. And we've, we've um, sorted them by information omission. So the first column here is information omission. So this is zero information omissions in green, and then 11 out of the 13 possible in red. And you can see that sometimes they're all green, sometimes they're all red, but they don't necessarily track together. And they didn't after either. So we see fewer information omissions. The maximum here is nine. But we still see, even if you've got pretty good information exchange, you can have horrid teamwork. Uh, and so we're still trying to unpack what, what that means. When we looked at information omission, took a deeper dive into what people were talking about, uh, we saw that the information improvement was only in new patients. And so sort of going back, we have to figure out what is it about the patients that are readmitted to the ICU that is giving people potentially a false sense of security and having them not robustly transmit information. So the, the new patients are ones that have never been in the ICU. The readmits are people who started off in the ICU, went to the operating room, and then came back again. When we looked at field notes, uh, we found that we were tracking that everybody was doing the handoff at bedside, which is great, and everyone took notes, but we, we had an information template as well that went with this, and no one used it. That's all right. Um, so limitations of this work. So the quasi-experimental design clearly is problematic. Moving forward, uh, we're looking at doing this in multiple ICUs and randomizing implementation strategies as opposed to interventions, but um, this work is hard to randomize. Certainly at the patient level, there are concerns about contamination, but even at the unit level, um, the ends become challenging really quickly. So I think this work is probably always going to be quasi-experimental, but just looking at ways to make it more robust. Um, both of these ICs were in the same health system, and so that limits transferability. Our sample size is relatively small, so total number of 160 handoff observations that we followed across phases, which actually puts us at the high end of all the studies that have been published, but it's still a modest number. And then we still are working on unpacking um, specialty-related differences in how they approach handoffs. Um, professions, so nurses versus physicians versus advanced practice providers, and then demographics, or men and women, um, as an example, interacting differently. We do have a number of offshoots that are happening with our project, and so uh, some of my intrepid undergrads, um, Cecilia Wang, who's an undergrad nursing student, noticed that there were champions, self-designated champions of hat -trick. so they would walk in a room and they'd go, we're hat-tricking now, and no, no one asked them to do that. We didn't pay them, we didn't, they just decided that this was their thing, and they were going to champion it. So she's doing an interview study to try to understand why, so that moving forward, we can actually prospectively encourage the development of champions who keep the intervention going. Um, Scott Massa, who's an undergrad, who's going to med school soon, um, is looking at disciplinary differences in communication. So the best name we could come up with was DISCO. <laughs> and, um, and then we're doing our sustainability work. So going back to our subway, um, this is why I'm here, sort of to generate a conversation about when is evidence ready for translation, when, how can hybrid effectiveness implementation trials help us, and um, sort of relying on that randomized control trial is the one standard of evidence I think is problematic for lots of reasons, and so we have to think about ways to, to be creative, but rigorous at the same time. So my takeaway points, um, ideal evidence isn't always available, and so we kind of have to figure out whether we're gonna generate that evidence or whether we're gonna work with what we've got. The tension for change may actually tip the balance toward doing implementation studies, even if you would really rather be in the effectiveness space. Um, and hybrid effectiveness implementation studies can be really useful when you have evidence where you're not, not sure. I have to acknowledge my team, um, both my lab team and my home team, and then the centers that have sponsored me, funders, and then um, lots of pictures. And that's it. I forgot to mention people from the East Coast talk, talk really fast. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm from here, but I'm, yeah, they, they, they got me. <laughs> you uh, did a fabulous job. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And now we're open for some questions, dialogue. Uh, maybe when you ask a question, you can introduce yourself and say anything about what you do. And, yeah.
I'm Jeff Belcora, Hi. and I work with uh, the Patient Support Corps, which uh, trains um, undergrad pre-medical students to be patient advocates. Great. Um, so I, I think you were maybe talking fast, or I missed it. <laughs> um, so I got, the, I think I got the information on missions. Um, what underlying outcomes, like you might be studying at a unit level, is it length of stay, or the mortality, morbidity? You know, what do we what do we think about our handoff might, on some level, improve in terms of the sort of physical care? So it's all of those things. So let me find my outcomes here, but basically unit length of stay, um, adverse events, which is a composite outcome, so looking at unplanned extubations or reintubations, looking at hemodynamic instability, uh, acute kidney injury requiring dialysis are the types of adverse events we're interested in, IC length of stay, hospital length of stay, IC mortality, hospital mortality, but those are big concepts to move, and actually that's one of the challenges that we have in this work is thinking about what the right kinds of outcomes are because there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship to the process that we're studying and the outcomes that we're interested in. They're multifactorial. You can have a horrible handoff and a great outcome, and a great handoff and a horrible outcome. So we end up looking at all of these different, these different measures. The process outcomes, at least for our stakeholders, have been sufficient for them to continue to be invested and engaged in the project. But thinking about what payers are interested in, what hospitals, hospital administrators are interested in, it's probably more the length of stay and, and cost. Could you build a logic model for some of these multifactorial influences? Like no, not at this point, but that's that's a good idea moving forward. Yeah, I think so. This this has to do with Oh, I'm sorry, Ralph is on. Oh. <laughs> your your reputation precedes uh, you, I know about you. But. <laughs> um, well this triggered in my mind, uh, and maybe because I've seen more over here as well, this concept of organizational effect modifiers. Yeah. Right? So you only did this in two ICUs, and it's part of the culture sure. of, of Penn. But you know, as we're trying to become a lean management system and a lean hospital, uh, I've been struck by how much that can affect the translation of evidence into practice and some of the implementation strategy success rates. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if you is lean uh, do you is lean part of the the environment at Penn, and are there other types of organizational factors? that you think we might consider in transferring your lessons from Penn to UCSF? Sure, so um, I say this with some trepidation with Laura right here, but there's the organizational decoupling. <laughs> um, so lean is what our administrators use, and we've got green belts and black belts and all of that. It doesn't really translate to bedside patient care. And so when I think about implementation strategies, I think about the different layers of the sociologic framework, and when it's those central ones, the individual and maybe team-based, um, characteristics, really I think about engaging the stakeholders and it's a little Berkeley crunchy-ish but I take a stance of humility in that I think that the frontline providers know what they're doing and they have a lot of insight and so I think having a dialogue with them about what strategies make sense and coming up with strategies with them I think is really useful but then you also of course have to account for the organizational factors too but I've been impressed with how separate those conversations are. Um, and you know, I'll go even to a national conference and someone from Penn will be talking about Lean and Six Sigma. And we don't see that at all in the ICUs, actually at the, at the patient bedside. So I don't know. I don't I mean, know. Your approach is very lean in terms of respecting the front line, the problem solvers are the people that take care of the patients. And, yeah. um, and so that's what triggered that thought in my mind as well. Right. So it's also you don't have the brand, it seems right. like you're using the approach. It's also inspired by human factors engineering and thinking about um, people as the experts in their own work and when they do workarounds and when they sort of come up with ways of doing things it's for a very particular reason and so if you learn from them I think that's useful I think the other thing I didn't talk about was when you message what you're doing especially for acute care clinicians who already feel pressed I mean everyone feels pressed I shouldn't say that everyone does um, the message is not here's another thing because nobody wants another thing the message is I want to make your life easier and that's really what we were trying to do was you know, we see what you're doing, we see this inefficiency, you're spending so much time on the phone, the patients are having adverse outcomes because their blood pressure isn't managed the way you want it to be. It would be easier if you did this, and that's a really appealing message. So that helps too. If you go to the frontline clinicians and you say, my goal is to make your job easier and not to impose something on you, then that, that helped us get a lot of traction. I have a question about um, <clears throat> early adopters. Sure. And whether you found these two sites to be among that, uh, kind of group of wanting to do this kind of instrumental change. And the second is, what are some of your ideas about uh, maintenance? 
sure. sustainability of the sort of excitement of introducing change and then having to keep that excitement going. Sure. So with respect to early adopters, um, I think one of the places that we got lucky was that there was attention for change and that people knew that there was a problem, but the barrier was that no one had the time or the energy to think about how to fix it. And so when we talked to people, it was, yes, universally this is bad, but how do we even start? What does that look like? How do we approach it? And I heard multiple times, I'm so glad that you're doing this. And so it, it was a ripe environment for us to introduce something because they already wanted something. It, it, so I'm doing some work now at Christiana Care Health System in Delaware to try to translate this work, and it's a complete, it's the other side. It's who are you and what do you want? Mm -hmm. And this is fine, why are you trying to fix it? And it's really, really hard. And so that conversation is very different. So I think some of it is just sort of what, what's the overall environment and what are people, is it, are they pulling or are you pushing? Um, what was your other question? Sustainability. Sustainability. So, yeah, I mean this, um, I don't want to make it sound like it's all accidental, but the champions were really helpful. The, the goal of this and the reason that we wanted, we involved nurses because they're at the front line, but we also wanted them to own the process in the room because they live in the ICUs and we thought that that was a, way, a pathway to sustainability because the physicians come and go, the residents come and go, but the nurses, that's sort of their home. And so we empowered them very early on and they were more, most of our champions were nurses there was something that happened where they just took it. They took the process away from our team. Not that it was a fight, we, it was great, but the, the time I knew that that had happened, so I went to Presbyterian, that was our, our secondary hospital, and um, they have a patient safety Olympics. So in the lobby of the hospital, all the different units show what their quality improvement projects are. They have videos, they have all, it's a whole big extravaganza. And I went down there one day, and the trauma SICU had dubbed Adele's hello, but they had changed all the words to be about hat trick. <laughs> <clears throat> it was all about the handoff. I had nothing to do with it. I did not know it was happening. They didn't tell me. And I said, oh, it's theirs now. And so that, that's how we've achieved sustainability is that they took it, which is great. But I wish I could say I made it happen. Um, moving forward, I think I would look for ways to make it happen. But I think it's going back to the engineering idea. You want to make it standard work. So initially there's that hurdle, let's create change, but then it needs to become part of the, just what we do every day. And integrating it into workflow, I think is one way to do that. So that it's not an add-on. It just complements what people are doing already. Are there any other questions, Laura? Yeah, I got introduced by Ralph. Uh, yeah, um, as you know, I teach this stuff to clinicians. Yeah, and I took your class online, it was so good. <laughs> and, you know, I, I love what you took away because I can see, you know, just baking it into the way people and, and, and people taking ownership of this stuff. Uh, because, and that's why I like teaching it to clinicians sure. uh, because the clinicians are there. The challenge is they have a very unique perspective yeah. and they can't see the whole organization. So they don't know what leadership is doing. Right. Uh, unless, unless, they, unless they're told to look for it. Right. Uh, at the risk of, you collected so many great kinds of data, I love it, but at the risk of making it even more complicated next time, uh, I would be really interested in looking at those surgeons and the clinicians' um, diary, it's a small sample who do a diary or something, uh -huh. so that you can, you can actually, uh, because evident, evidence for the purpose of implementation and sustainability uh, is demonstrating what people get. Sure. what the efficiency is and yeah. so if you knew if you had a record of and maybe this is in logs or whatever right. how many extra phone calls right got taken away yep. out of somebody's life how many emails are you know and you could even do this perspectively absolutely uh just you know. it'd be easier to do it perspectively yeah, yeah. but that's yeah. a that's a great insight and as it gets and and the other thing i, I just your talk was excellent and i just uh turned on a lot of light bulbs for me but one was uh, I'm currently doing a lot of work out in, in the T4 realm, mm -hmm. evidence to policy kind of stuff. And people are always asking, well, you know, what, what, you know, what's the evidence that soda taxes work or whatever right. that might be? And, or, the, or they'll say, you know, should I drink an artificial sweetener? Is that bad for me? Why, do you, why don't you tax that too? Right. And my shtick these days is always, well, 
it's a there's a different standard depending on the scale. Absolutely. So when you're doing something at the level of a city or a state or a nation, you want to be really, really sure and confident yeah. that what you've got is effective. You know, all, all the things, all the things. Yeah. Off every box. You've got systematic reviews and. But when you're when you're telling your daughter or a friend should they drink artificial, <laughs> right? It's a really different standard. It is. And I think one of the challenges for this kind of work is that clinicians and people in the healthcare system are very individual focused, yeah. and they aren't thinking that. And I mean, population health I think is helping some here, and the way it's being integrated into the medical system, but. It'd be really interesting to think about scale in relation to the, to the question of your talk. Absolutely. Those are great insights. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Thank you, everybody.